have a reason to sing Oh, I have a reason to worship This very breath that I breathe Is mercy that's new every morning Oh, I have a reason to praise I have a reason to celebrate
the Lord in royalty and I will lay
it's easy to lay your crown down when you realize that you can do nothing about your situation and the mess and then him who went to battle for us He went to battle for us that we could win. That we could win and be royalty. You wouldn't have a crown unless you were royalty. And then we lay it and give it to him. Man, how awesome is that? How awesome is that? Even when we were running from him, (laughs) even when we were running from him man God is that good that he loved us that much to clothe us in his righteousness that's the key it's his it ain't ours Father we thank you for what you're doing in our lives we thank you that when you didn't leave us to ourselves you did not leave us to ourselves and father you pursued us and chased us down and that's why we're here and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus name amen amen you may be seated title of this message is cost of freedom John chapter 8 verse 31 it says if you abide in my word then you are truly disciples of mine and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free now last week Kobe talked about functioning in freedom And so I thought I would tag on the end of that because the deal about freedom is is that there is going to be a cost of it. And the word abide, it means to stay. It means to continue. It means to endure. It means an expectancy. It means to be present. And the thing about what you see here is that we have to to walk in freedom we're going to have to stay and continue and endure and expect in God's word there is an expectancy when you begin to read God's word something begins to start stirring in you Because his word is alive and it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so it's moving and working. That's why a lot of times, and I'll just say me, when when I first got saved and try to be dumb, you're miserable. Sinning wasn't as fun anymore. Right? That's just me, I guess. And and when I still want to untwist and come untrained, who is always there right off the bat to tell you, you know you're going to have to repent. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the Holy Spirit through Wendy. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. As disciples, we're going to have to know his word and we're going to have to hold on to it. We're going to have to hold on to it because you got an enemy that's always trying to rob you of it. He's always trying to come in and separate you from what God's word is and he'll do and use anything and everything to do that. And as disciples, we're going to have to study it. If we're going to function in it, and listen, 
Because what God does is, is he begins to restore and redeem us of everything that the thief robbed us from. See, the thief is always trying to separate us from it. And it starts as a baby. The enemy, listen, we are born into just our flesh. And it starts as a baby. I know they're precious and they're cute and they're pretty, but have you ever looked at your child and went, what is going on? <laughs> they are red in the face and just, Wah! Mark says it best, they would eat you if they were able to right then. <laughs> See, they're... they're Flesh and their feelings and their emotions are driving them. And that's what's running everything in their little bitty being to just scream. That has to be directed. Come on. It's ruling their feelings and emotions. The flesh is. Look in Romans chapter 7, in verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. For the good that I wish, it almost sounds like Dr. Seuss wrote this. For the good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not wish, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. And the flesh is our problem. And the only one that can set us free from that battle and that war was Jesus. Because it is a war. And we are always at battle with this is the battle. Our neighbors, the traffic, the come on, that's not the battle. We like to make it the battle. That's why everybody shoots a finger in traffic. But that's not the problem. See, our flesh is the problem and it produces death and that must be dealt with, right? That's why we're a mess. And that's why we have to be disciples and that's why we have to abide in the word to know the truth, to be set free. And we have to be set free from the de desire of giving in to our flesh and all it wants because our hearts get broke. We break hearts. We make dumb choices. We have selfish, fleshly desires and passions and we become captive to it. We become captive to by our pride, our ego, and our flesh guides us into all of that. And that's why it's got to be dealt with. And that's hard to do. Because we, we, we read the word and then we have to endure and understand. Listen, and here's the thing about the word of God and God. The closer you get to God, the dirtier you're going to feel. So that's why it's hard for me when people think they're so close to God that they can be all pious and come on because that's not how this works. The closer you get to God, the more the mirror's on you to figure out, man, you're a mess. 
That's why we say around here, we ain't got no rocks. We're just trying to get through this thing and finish strong. Come on. Only Jesus can set us free. Jesus becomes the governor of our flesh. That's why his mercies are new every day. Because before, before you get out of this parking lot, you, you, you would liable to mess up. I mean, you get right out of here, something's going to grate on you. Hey, how about that road? It, and they're not done yet. Yeah. So there's going to be another layer of oil and another little bit of chip and then another layer. And, man, they're going to get that thing where the dust is not going to be on your car. And when you leave here, you're going, man, that you're going down that road all the time. Get my car dirty. I just washed it. <laughs> See? It happens. Get control of that flesh. Luke come by and he said, hey, I got a bone to pick with you. He said, I see this deal, this serve team deals. How can I serve you? He said, nobody will wash my truck for me. <laughs> he said, I don't get it. See, only Jesus can do this. Not religion, religious duty or obligations, but Jesus. And we're going to look at truth. And how this all came about and how important process is. Isaiah 61, if you got your Bibles, turn there. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up. The broke, bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners to proclaim the favorable, favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to confront all who mourn to grant those who mourn in Zion giving them a garland instead of ashes the oil of gladness instead of mourning the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. And here's, look in Luke chapter 4. Because Isaiah was prophesying about Jesus here. And this is very important that we see this. And we understand because in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, and Jesus returned to Galilee. This is after Jesus had been in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, fasting and being tempted by the devil. And then it says, it, what's really great is when you read that, it says he got baptized and the Holy Spirit came and took him to the wilderness. It's very important because there you begin to see that there is a process that takes place. It's not just come down here to the altar, say a prayer, wait to go to heaven. That's not it. Acknowledging Jesus and believing in him is the starting line, not the finish line. And so when we get that right, we see the process and Jesus comes out of there and it says, and Satan said he'll, he'll be back at a more opportune time. Just because he was baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost, went through temptations in the wilderness and went through the process, did not exempt him, come on, from being attacked again. Because the enemy is always trying to separate you from what God has ordained in your life. That's why he said, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen. Come on now. So he comes out and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit 
And news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue of, on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written and began to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, proclaim, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now look in verse 20. And he closed the book gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt. You will quote this proverb to me. I'm, I'm going a little past, guys, which y'all probably might have it. Physicians, heal yourselves. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel. And he goes on. And then it gets down to a point where it, after he read that, the lame, the blind, he was starting to heal them all. Right there in the synagogue in front of all the people. He said, this is, the, this is fulfilled. He didn't have a message of doom and gloom. He had a message of hope. Come on. He had a message that I'm for you. I've he I'm here to bring back, to set you free, to pardon you from your sins and to break the chains that you've been captive to. I'm here to relieve you of your flesh and the opinions of everybody else about you. Come on, man. That's what he does. It's not a message of beat you up, you sorry old sinner. That wasn't his message. His message, when he come out of the wilderness, he goes straight to the prophecy, says this is fulfilled. And he starts his ministry. Listen, that's why he told his mother, my time is not yet. Because he hasn't been through the process. Come on, think about that. His own mother come up to him and said, hey, just y'all do whatever he says. Turns around and walks off. And he's like, hey, it's not my time. See, the time was that he had to get baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, taken to the wilderness, go through the temptations, walk out, and then say, but like most mamas do, Kind of rushed it a little bit. <laughs> I got something I need. He says, I've been anointed. That word anointed means smeared. Means rubbed. It means employed. And here's what else it means. To furnish what is needed. If you don't go through that process... Every believer, not just this guy right here that stands in the pulpit, every believer goes through this rubbing, smearing, to be employed so that you can be furnished with what is needed to be an influence where you're at on your jobs, in your schools, 
Ever, everywhere you're at, your voice is needed where it's at. And we have allowed certain things to shut our voice up. And it's time that we take that back because that's our job. That's why God put us here. That's why we have to understand that there's a process when we get baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, go through the wilderness. Listen, it takes time, but your voice is important where you're at. It's highly important where you're at. And I can't say that enough because we are possessing God's promises and inheritance. That's what he took the people out of Egypt, took them through the wilderness, took them to the promised land, their inheritance. Come on. See, they went through the Red Sea, the baptism of Moses, of repentance in water. Then they went through the wilderness to learn and know how to talk with God, how to be with God, what God expected. And God was taking them to a promised land that they were supposed to possess, inherit, come on, and keep it and cultivate it. Because there was an enemy that they were taking it from that wasn't just going to give it to them. And that's why it's important that you abide in the word and that you know what his word says so that you can walk and function in the truth. Because the truth is, an enemy is always going to try to be taking your promise and inheritance away from you. How did Goliath show up years later standing on the tribe of Judah's land and demand to fight? If I win, you serve me. If, we, if you win, I'll serve you. I got news for the devil. You can't have my land because you don't have a covenant for it. I have a covenant for it, so you can just keep talking, squawking, and trying to fight, but I still win. And that's why we lay our crowns down, because you're already fighting from a place of victory, not for it. Come on. Because he already solidified that victory for us. That's the truth, because he was anointed to do that so that we can possess, take our promise, that we can keep it, we can cultivate it. Come on. Hebrews 2, 17. It says, For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Listen, he is familiar with our afflictions and oppressions. and everything. He had to go to the garden. The enemy showed up in the garden. And his feelings and his emotions of knowing where he was going was beginning to weigh on him. Come on, he grew up looking at that cross and the crucifixion and how cruel Rome was. Can you imagine growing up around that all the time, knowing that's your purpose, that's your destiny? Watching the dogs lick the blood off of the cross and the birds plucking their eyes. And come on, y'all hearing how, how gruesome a crucifixion was and knowing that's my purpose and destiny. And when it got down to it, I guarantee you the reason he was sweating blood is because the devil was right there going, are you really sure? Same thing he said to Eve. Is that what God said? There's got to be another way. There's got to be another way. Oh, just think. Remember when I offered you all of this? Come on. He always tries to take us back to our past. Remember when, you, when I offered you all of this? I'm going to offer it to you again. Come on. Not my will, but his be done. 
not my will, but his be done. Come on. You can just hear the devil squeam, scream and leave in grimace knowing that he couldn't invoke his will. See, the enemy's always trying to invoke his will back on you to be a captive, to be a prisoner, to take you into exile. Come on. See, there's a cost to freedom. There's a cost to walking in the word and the truth. It's the, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. Listen, you, if you're going to walk in his way, you're going to go through the truth, and the truth is going to squeeze and mash you. It's going to squeeze and mash you, but it's for your good. And it will produce life. Come on. See that word bind? He said, I, I'm here to bind up the brokenhearted. It means to wrap firmly. It means to compress. It means to gird about. It means to govern. It means healer. And here's what's cracked me up. It means to saddle. When you hear the word of God, <clears throat> now hear me. When you hear the word of God and you believe, wow, Jesus is the son of God. He saddles himself to you. Come on. The thief on the cross didn't have to get down, go to the altar, say a prayer, or be baptized, or anything. Jesus saddled himself to him, said, I will be with you in paradise. Come on, are y'all with me? When Jesus, when you believe, that man believed, and he was clothed in Jesus' righteousness. Jesus saddled himself to him. And that means he's there to govern. He's there to walk us through life. Come on. As we abide in him, he clings to us. And he says, no, that's dumb thinking. No, this is right. Yeah, this is here's where we're going. This is what, because what he's doing is he's trying to get us to our ordained purpose. That is going to scare us. Because you're not going to have enough money. You're not going to have the ability. You're not going to know exactly where you're headed. And he's going to define it, take care of it, and prove to you that he is your provider. He's the one that's going to get you there. That's why we lay our crowns down. Come on. This can take all the pressure off of you that you don't have to jump through the hoops. You can just come to the word and abide in the word and know that he's going to get you to where you're going. Yes, you have to. Yes, if you're alive and you're walking this thing out, you need to be baptized because it is, it is a symbol, come on, of what God is doing on the inside of you that you have died to yourself saying, hey, I'm, fixing, I'm in the process and I'm going through it. That's what it's for. Jesus' message is of God's favor. His grace is for freedom. It's a pardon to the captives. And now you have a guide to freedom and your purpose. Truth is that Jesus is going to begin a process in you. In the process, he's tearing down all the things that have bound us up by saddling himself to us. That's the truth. Because there's lots of things that has to be tore down so that he can restore. Come on, how many of y'all ever done any restoration in your house? Have you had to tear down some things? There's some, there's some old things that has to leave. 
some old mindsets. Listen, it, I mean, it, you can't get around it. Matthew 21. Let's turn there. Matthew 21. Verse 12, and Jesus entered the temple and cast out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. It's amazing to me how we miss so much in the gospel. Here Jesus walks in. Now remember, he's anointed. And he walks into the temple. And he begins to turn tables over. And he begins to kick the seats over. Of, he says, my house is a house of worship. It's a house of prayer. It's a place where you can go and have hope. It's a place where you can go and lay down your... It's a place where you can go and, and, and posture yourself to say, God, I can't do this on my own. It's a place where we can go, come on, in our truck, in the shower, because we are the temple, right? But here's the thing. There's always going to be a robber. There's always going to be thieves who are trying to set up tables and to plunder you. That's what robbers do. They plunder. They come in and they try to separate you from what is good, what is yours, what you've tried to work for. Come on, man. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's why Jesus has to come into our lives every now and then and kick over a few tables and take out a few chairs where the enemies come and try to deceive us so that he can continue to plunder us from what is rightfully ours. Come on. That's why nobody, nobody can be critical or judgmental when they come to Jesus because everybody is subject to to the enemy coming and trying to plunder and set up a seat at your table. And Jesus said, I came to set you free. Abide in my word and you'll know the truth. Because the enemy will use everything and everybody to try to plunder you. He'll use your own family. He'll use church folk. He'll use your boss. He'll use somebody under you. He'll use, come on, y'all hear me. He'll use anybody and everything to try to rob you and take your freedom and your inheritance and what is promised to you. He does it all the time. People buy into it. That's why people are so easily offended. And Jesus walked in there and offended every one of them. Come on. Kicked over some tables. But automatically, he began to heal the lame. He began to open blind eyes. He began, listen. My house, he says, my place is a place of hope. It's a place where you can go and have wishes and dreams and get your desires. Come on, God said, I'll give you the desires of your heart, but it's not going to be your flesh. It's going to be his desires. Come on, right? God's put desires in you, but you got to get your head right, know the truth, so you can get your what right. Because when you get your what right, then you can understand why you got what you got 
and that's how that's going to work. And he's always going to try to be plundering that and setting up a seat of influence. Come on. Here's what you have to realize. At times, Jesus will offend your mind to reveal what's in your heart. And what's important is we have to understand how truth works. See, when we speak the truth into our realm of influence, sometimes that can get a little... And so you have to maybe dribble truth out. Right? I'm learning this. Okay? I know I can be a little insensitive at times, but it's a process that we go through. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. See, this is the process that we go through. We're learning... because Jesus is always going to be turning over things in our life. I, I mean, he, and he doesn't just walk in there and just kick everything over and say, here. You know. No, he'll just kick one over here. <laughs> then a little while we'll go down the road and he'll kick another one over. And man, you're just like, oh, has anybody else ever been there? Because I have been. And he'll kick some old mindsets. Because we do. We get in some of them old mindsets of lies, doubts, fears. Come on, there's lies that the enemy tells you that you're always going to be this way. Your daddy was an alcoholic. Your granddaddy was an alcoholic. Your mama was a a drug addict. You're going to be a drug addict. It's just in your gene. No, it ain't in your gene. It's a thief. It's a robber trying to plunder you of a purpose and a destiny that God has ordained. Do you realize God was singing your life over you before you were even born? God was speaking about you before you was even born. Before there was one day, God had already ordained a life of purpose and destiny over you. And John 10.10 says the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's trying to rewrite that proclamation that God spoke over your life. Come on. See, this is the truth. Jesus is the way. And he is the life. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. See, there's always things coming against us. Every person on this earth has a race set before them. And it says to fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. I appreciate all the great comments and all the things that everybody says. Oh, man. DCC changed my life. No, Jesus changed your life. Jesus changed your life. Jesus, only Jesus did. Not come into this building, but God came and we allow him to use us. 
as broken and messed up as we are, listen, that's what God does. He uses broken people. He doesn't use perfect people. He uses broken people because that's how God works. People who are willing to let themselves go through the process. And so what you see around here is people who say, you know what? I ain't perfect, but by God, Jesus is saddled to me. Let's go. And we're all going to make dumb mistakes, and we're all going to, but let me tell you something we're going to do. We're going to keep coming to the house of God because he's still working on us. And there ain't a bucket of rocks around here for anybody. Because, see, there's always sin that's going to be trying to entangle us. But if we're willing to continue to come, if we're willing, that's why I tell them boys all the time, I don't care if you're high, if you're drunk, or if you're tweaking, chewing your lears off, I don't care. Just keep coming. Because something, something in the Word of God is going to penetrate in you and it's going to start growing. It's going to, listen, not everybody is just automatically delivered. Man. It, oh, come on. Not everybody is automatically delivered. It's a process. Come on. You can't expect a porn addict to sit there and not be tempted by it all the time. That's why it's You've got to learn that there is a guard over your mind. You can't expect somebody that's been a good cusser all their life to just quit. Come on. We got to quit taking ourselves so serious. God founded the United States. His word through men who were not perfect. They weren't perfect. But they seen something in the word of God. And that's what they went for. And they wrote it down in our constitution. They wrote it down in the bylaws. And they said, if you'll have faith, you'll keep this first come on we won't have to go back to being captive to a tyrannical government a government that's always trying to tell us how to live but if we live according to the word of God where Jesus Christ is the government that we go by then we'll love our neighbors as ourself and he Come on. The only constitution that has ever lasted this long is one that was founded on the word of God. And you can see why the enemy has been trying to set a seat up in our government. It is important that we do our part Duties ours, results are God's. But we have got to get involved. Because every area that you work in, live in, go to school, needs your voice in it. Our country needs help. It needs discipline. Do you see that the enemy has brought in to the United States no discipline. Taking it out. It blessed me when Kobe Trent walks into the restaurant. He's got his wooden paddle spoon in his back pocket. Walks by the sheriff's table. The sheriff's like, what are you going to do with that? 
Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do with it, because here in a minute, my boys are fixing to get out of hand. <laughs> and I'm going to take care of this so that one day you don't have to take care of it. Amen. He said the sheriff wanted to get up and hug him. <laughs> Come on, it's, it's, it's deception. It's the enemy trying to step in. See, if you abide in me, and abide in my word, it'll begin to abide in you. And listen, without discipline, nobody likes correction, in, right? Ain't nobody in here like it. I did not like my mama wearing me out. But look at me. <laughs> now, my sister's a little off, but... Come on, it's not going to kill you. Oh, man, I'm telling you. The thing that put the sweetest icing on a cake that every kid loves was an instrument of pain for me. My mama wore me out with that spatula. She'd say, give me your hand. I'm like, I want to give you my hand or my butt. <laughs> she gave me a spanking in the first grade that I still remember to this day. <laughs> first grade, first day of school, well, first week of school, she'd drop me off at one door and I'd walk through and go out the back door. I wouldn't even stop. I'd just keep going. And if I could get to the tree line, I had it made. And then I'd go home, I'd crawl up the country and, man, live my best life for a week until that day. And I, I was up in that country and I heard the phone ring. And my aunt picked up the phone. She said, no, he's not here. No, she's not here. I was like, oh, man, this is not going to be good. My mama came home pulled my pants down and whooped me. Let me tell you something. I went through 12 more years of school and never skipped school again. <laughs> so it ain't going to hurt you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have so great a cloud of witnesses. Verse 26. And his voice, his word, shook the earth then, but now... He has promised, saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of the things which can be shaken as of created things in order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service and reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. Let me tell you, he started shaking years ago. 2020 revealed, come on, peeled back the layer of the lack of faith in the body of Christ and how out of order it was. And God's word is bringing correction and order and the truth of who we are. We are his. We're not to get all caught up, but we're to go through the process. We're to go through the process. And listen, most of you knew deep down inside that there was more to Christianity, right? Than just saying a prayer, waiting to go to heaven. There's more to it than that. There's a lot more to it. You just couldn't put your finger on it. See, he did this and suffered and became the high priest so that his message for us of hope in a better way wouldn't get weighed down with worries, the sin that easily entangles us and keeps us from running our race of our ordained purpose to win 
God wants us to win. That's why he died. See, there's a process of anointing. And as disciples, we're going to go through the same process, the tearing down and the building up for our ordained purpose. And if you're here, you felt that. And you know there's more. Listen, purpose without process yields no fruit. And in John 15, you can read, God wants us to bear fruit, much fruit, more fruit. Come on. And when you read and study the Bible and you see how they make the anointing oil, we see also in the lives of Abraham. We see it in the life of Joseph, of Moses. We see it in David and Joshua. Jesus, we've seen the same process in Jesus that we've seen in the Old Testament. And where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the word Gethsemane means press. Jesus would often go to this garden, press. And it was in the middle of an olive grove. And what they would do is they would pick the olives and they would begin to press them. And as they would press them, they would begin to smash them and they had and the oil would begin to drip and they would have to go through a process to get the pulp to get the all the stuff out of it that wasn't just purely the oil Abraham was called in Genesis chapter 12 but it wasn't until Genesis 22 that God said indeed I will a lot of living took place. A lot of pressing. A lot of tables got kicked over in Abraham's life. Joseph had a dream. Joseph was sold by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold by his brothers, ended up in Potiphar's house, ended up in prison and forgotten. Come on, are y'all with me? David was anointed at 15 to be the king. But he had to kill the bear, the lion, and the giant and then go through the cave being hunted down like a dog all the while knowing that he was anointed to be king. He comes out of the cave ready to be king. The lion didn't make him ready. The bear wasn't. The giant he killed, he still wasn't ready to rule the kingdom until he went through the cave and got his feelings and his emotions stretched Come on. There is a process. And we see Jesus in Gethsemane in the garden where the pressure is on. So if the pressure is on, just know God's doing something. If the pressure is on, God's doing something. He may be trying to kick over some tables or he may be trying to empty out some things that what come on, are y'all with me? But just know that on the other side of the press is that refining oil. There's going to be a voice come out of you that speaks into the lives of people around you. When you're anointed, you're anointed to preach the good news. Not the doom and gloom, the good news. 
Come on, are y'all with me? John 13, 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master. Neither is one who sent greater than the one who's sinning. True freedom is first knowing where it comes from. True freedom comes from Jesus. And he has saddled himself to us and is taking us through a process. Come on, if y'all would stand. Listen, our prayer team comes up when we close. And if you need prayer for anything, they're here. They're here. Maybe you need to surrender. Maybe you need to surrender to the tables being turned over. Kick them over, God. But that's why they're here. And let me tell you something. Who we? There's some powerful prayer team right here. It has been amazing things that God's been doing. So I just want to tell you that before I close. If you need anything, they're always here to pray. But I want you to know, I love you. I love you. And I know he does. And whatever pressure you're under, just know he's taking you somewhere. Because when you saddle up a horse, you've got something intentions for him. And he can either submit to it or he can buck around. Come on. I've been taken to the round pen many times. Many times. But that round pen is for my good. It's for my good. Because you know, I don't even know all the potential that's in me. But the one who is training, trying to get me to be obedient, trying to get me in the right lead, come on. That's what he does. See, we were born for this time. For this time when everybody's confused. This time when it seems everything seems so undisciplined. Everything seems so confusing and everything seems so crazy. We were born for this time. To be a voice of truth to be a light in the midst of the darkest times, this is why we were born. This is why we were born. Father, I thank you. And I pray that we leave out of here knowing, Father God, that we are in a process. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to be obedient. And Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. I thank you for our realm of influence that we are going to impact for you, for the kingdom of God. And we give you the praise and glory for everything because you're the one who saddled yourself to us.
to give us what we needed, to furnish us with what we need to do your work that you invited us to. And we thank you that we get to do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Love y'all. If you need prayer, just come on up.